So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. As I say, we are very much hoping that we will be joined by our second speaker. But if not, then we have a half session and we can join the other session uh, in the middle. Um, yes, as Carly's just put in the chat, if you have any questions, um, use the raise hand function. Maybe that, uh, feel free to use both. So uh, perhaps you raise your hand so I know, uh, I can see there's a question and then also put something in the chat. And uh, if I'm ignoring you, please also just maybe shout out because we're quite a small group. Uh, if you can, just hold your questions until after the presentations uh, or, well, or in between or after the presentations, then that would be great. So our first uh, speaker is uh, Margarita Kashmarek, a PhD candidate at the University of Łódź, uh, Faculty of Management. And she's an expert in the field of music with more than 20 years experience uh, and is professionally connected with the Łódź Philharmonic um, specialist in organisation and programming of the institution's activities. Her interests, uh, research interests, focus on effective management in cultural institutions, organisational culture, economics of culture, and economic and social aspects of philharmonic and orchestra's activity in Poland. Today, she's going to be talking to us about quiet management. So I'll now hand over to Margaret. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Margaret Kaczmarek. Um, I'm, uh, it's a uh, real pleasure to welcome you today and uh, I am really honored to put present in front of you my last uh, findings um, and they are connected with quiet management. Let me uh, share with you my presentation. I hope you can see it. We yes? Can, we can see your view of it, so if you just go to full okay. screen. Yes, I tried. Perfect. Okay, I tried. So, um, uh, as you said, uh, I am a PhD candidate, and uh, I, I will be focusing uh, on uh, in, my, in my PhD thesis on um, management of Polish Philharmonic orchestras. But today, I would like to uh, share with you my last uh, findings about quiet management, um, and uh, to. Um, uh, 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 during my presentation, uh, I would like to run through this uh, agenda you may see on the screen, but um, I would like you to know the, the aim uh, of my research. I just wanted to find uh, answers to uh, following questions. Are the conductors aware of power of quiet management? If and how the quiet management um, by Henry Minsberg is put uh, uh, into practice? and for what purpose quiet management is used nowadays. Um, of course, um, uh, the, the awareness is the most important thing, and I wanted, uh, I wanted to find answers by making, co conducting uh, some interviews. It was qualitative research. I made uh, previously desk research and uh, benchmarking. Uh, but let me start uh, with the story. Uh, at the end of uh, last century, uh, Henry Mintzberg um, uh, was shadowing uh, Bramwell Taway, uh, conductor and artistic director of Winnipeg Symphony uh, Orchestra. And uh, as a result uh, of this uh, observation, Henry Mintzberg developed uh, a concept of quiet uh, management. Um, uh, this uh, few sentences illustrate uh, in a perfect way assumptions uh, of a quiet management concept. So you may see that professionals require little direction and supervision, that uh, what they require is protection and support, that people need to be trusted uh, and they don't need to be empowered, and that quiet managers inspire people. They foster openness and release uh, energy. What's more, quiet management is about infusion. Uh, uh, it's about the continuous, uh, continuous uh, improvement and uh, it's uh, rooted in experience. Uh, but uh, before uh, I continue, let me stop for a while uh, uh, to, to mention some specific uh, characteristic of the orchestra. Um, we probably all know that uh, orchestra has a very high level of standardization, that uh, the hierarchy and structure and tradition, they are present. Uh, but uh, we have also 
uh, situation of very specific form of subordination uh, while each musician is responsible for himself himself at, at the same time. The goal is the music of the highest quality and the work is based on the result. Um, I'm also, uh, of course, uh, telling you that uh, from my point of view, I mean the point of view of uh, Polish orchestras uh, situated in the Eastern Europe. So probably you may have uh, another uh, experiences, but let me share my point of view with you. So the, the main question, my question was, how the orchestra and the musicians should be managed. And it is about my research. Uh, I have conducted 10 interviews with 10 professionally active conductors and what was important for me, conductors with managerial experience. What I mean by that, I wanted them be the same time as conductors to be artistic directors, music directors or chief conductors, of course, of Polish orchestras. But uh, some of them, they had, of course, uh, international experience. Uh, it was nine men and one woman. Uh, it was semi-structured interview and it was conducted in February and March this year. Um, I used the grounded theory to make uh, a content analysis. And as a result of my research, I have distinguished five main methods consciously used by conductors. You may find here project management, participative management, distributed leadership, diversity management, and of course, quiet management. So the quiet management is one of the methods consciously used by conductors nowadays in Poland. And uh, during this uh, interviews, um, my uh, interviewers, they always stressed that the cooperation with the musicians must be based on trust and on respect. Why? Because they want to build accountability by valuing musicians. And it's the most important thing. And they have repeated it all the time. They also seek for nonverbal communication and they want to leave space for improvement because they want always to refer to the professionalism of musicians. They always, so you know better, my dear uh, musicians, and they don't want to distort the orchestra. But this referring to professionalism is crucial. Uh, as a result of the research, I. Uh, I just uh, had a few, um, uh, few findings that quiet management is used mostly intuitively by conductors, but trust seems to be the crucial factor to of the cooperation in the cooperation with professionals. Um, it's because um, uh, when we take into consideration uh, the specific of the orchestra, of course, the system should be inherent to the profession. And uh, I had also this feeling that because they were not only conductors, but also artistic directors, that quiet management seems to work better in organizations with viable organizational frameworks. Uh, but uh, uh, as you know, I have started my uh, research uh, taking into consideration only quiet management. Uh, I made uh, analysis and uh, as a result of uh, the, uh, analyzing this uh, description of uh, interviews, I tried um, to find, uh, I had this feeling that I am finding something more, that uh, what the, the conductor they, they told to me is maybe not as much connected with quiet management but it is more connected with talent management. And uh, that's why uh, I try to match the definitions with the findings. And that's why now I would like to uh, present you some definitions of talent, which suits uh, the orchestra best, of course, in my opinion. Let me start with uh, the um, uh, definition of least fun that talent people are the people who possess a high level of competencies 
desired by the organization. It's very important, but especially for musicians, I have found also another criteria that musicians, they, they possess some kind of critical talent because it's directly involved in achieving the objectives of the organization. That orchestra can be treated as a talent pool and talent, of course, is a feature of uh, people. It's an objective approach, but the, the, the talent could be exclusive as, as one we have this uh, example in orchestras because it is unique and rare. Talent as a mastery is obvious thing, but talent as a passion understood as being in the right organization, in the right position at the right time is of course something we will be seeking for. To sum up, talents uh, in an uh, organization are a group of people with rare and specific uh, skills requiring a different approach to the way of management. And talent management is a way, it's a new way of building competitiveness and operational efficiency. Let me now uh, present a table and I would like to draw your attention to the talent management stages. And you may see here that uh, in this maintenance stage uh, where we have the development, managing, and uh, remuneration. Quiet management um, is, um, it, it, well, it's just this development refers to the self-respect and to the quiet management practice as we, of course, will be working and we, we have a situation of passionate professionals in our organization. And, uh, Thanks to this table, you may compare organizations and orchestras where in what cases talent workers play the key role. And you may find here that organizational culture may be crucial and allows, allows uh, develop talents um, because um, here we may find a significant, significant link which uh, refers us again to the, to the uh, quiet management. Uh, the, the main uh, differences we may find here in this managing stage and remuneration. Of course, uh, uh, I have found this uh, information that for musicians, uh, uh, remuneration seems to be less important because of the passion and approach. But of course, it not, must, not, must not be the true for, for example, all countries and all orchestras. What uh, the, the main difference I have found is here, because uh, of course, we cannot treat talents in, or, in orchestras as individuals, but uh, we must just adopt some kind of group attitude. So uh, uh, as I said, the, the, the main differences are, or the specifics specific of the orchestra, we may find in this managing, managing, managing part. Uh, you may find here the, 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 the whole strategy of talent management, which should be, which should be implemented, of course, in all organizations. Uh, uh, from my experience, I may say that uh, with some stages, um, uh, we cope, uh, we tackle, but uh, with some stages, we have uh, problems. Uh, for example, uh, the, 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 the layoffs in Polish orchestras are mainly generated by, uh, by retirement age. So the rotation rate in Polish orchestras, orchestras is quite low. Uh, and uh, final conclusions uh, about my research uh, about quiet management and talent management. Quiet management supports talent management in case of artistic organizations. Quiet management is used to enhance the strength of talents is in, one, in an organization. Quiet management and talent management is about building a culture of mutual respect. While quiet management is used mostly intuitively and we have saw it, talent management required adequate strategy and implementation. And of course, these issues certainly require 
future uh, research. Um, uh, what's more, um, uh, applying the concept of quiet management is actually a practical application of the principles of modern planet management, because it is all about creating a culture of goals that inspire people. People are the greatest resource of any organization and talented employees are critical uh, to the continued success and growth of any orchestra. And in a knowledge-based economy or a hybrid change environment, uh, an employee's unique talent and competencies are a competitive advantage. Thank you very much. Uh, I sincerely uh, appreciate uh, your attention today and I will be more than happy to answer your questions. Many thanks, Margaret Jatta. And um, I wonder if, uh, if possible, well, yeah, maybe if you, uh, towards the end, if you have the chance to share your slides uh, in the chat, that might be uh, useful for people. Um, maybe not right now, because we've got to uh, think about questions. Um, I can't see any immediate questions, but one, I was wondering just, just for me as a, as a non-management uh, person could you just very briefly outline what is really um, distinct about quiet management in uh, uh, in contrast to other forms of, of management um, well um uh, the, the, the respect and and uh, and um yes well and trust uh, it's uh, really something uh, what was uh, very often repeated by my uh, conductors. Of course, it wasn't named like this. They, they, they never said, oh, I'm using quiet management because it's efficient in, in, from my point of view. But they, they have repeated that they try to build this atmosphere of trust, of mutual respect, just to gain uh, the, 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 the uh, objectives they have to, to achieve something together. And it is, I think it is a big change in mentality of uh, today's conductors because they know they cannot behave like Salibidash or uh, Tuscanini anymore. They, they need to refer it to the, I, I wouldn't say democracy, but they, they, they need to refer it to the ethic maybe more of every musician and just um, inspire them to, to be better musicians and, okay. and, and how, they, uh, how they can do it without using you know, any, um, any, uh, any um, uh, stick. Yeah, yeah and a stick <laughs> and a stick. So, so the, the, they must do to build another kind of comprehension of collaboration. And it, it's, it's from this point of view is crucial. And um, talent management what, what was, uh, uh, which revealed from this, uh, from this uh, interviews uh, uh, and talks later, um, it just is it, uh, something maybe we, we don't, we do not think as much as we could because uh, the, the people's approach to the work uh, and to the ethic of work has changed as well. So we need to gain their attention and we need to create for them also the place where they want to be and want, want to develop. And they must feel that we create of them. And it cannot be said only by words. That's why I wanted to uh, stretch, stress that it must be some kind of strategy, some kind of very global thinking or thinking of an, an, an organization that has talents. And uh, when we have an um, uh, orchestra, we have only talents. We almost do not have other people, yes? Yeah? So, so it's, um, maybe it's more a group of talents, but we need to, 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 to build for them some kind of very safe conditions of work. And it was also uh, very often repeated by conductors, how, how to do it, how to make uh, the musicians feel safe uh, to, 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 to let develop only, to sure. only think about this musical development, musical mastery. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from uh, Paulina. Yeah, thank you very much. I just wanted to ask if um, um, during your research you could find maybe a potential effect of quiet management on diversity issues or a connection, and maybe if you could also combine it with the approach of diversity management. Well, starting as of by the fact that um, most of the interviewers were uh, male conductors. So. <laughs> okay, but, but, but I, I tried, of course, it's not as, as men and female conductors still in Poland, you know, uh, have, having an uh, uh, having an position because of course the, there is a lot of conducting women in Poland but I wanted just to find uh, uh, as I said uh, people with managerial experience uh, so um, uh, I can I can just uh, 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 illustrate you uh, how it is in our orchestra by by diversity management we may think of uh, the age of course. Uh, for example, the gen gender and um, and uh, such a things and uh, for example, our orchestra is uh, divided uh, very um, how to say um, not systematically, but uh, uh, I, I have the same number of young people as very old people. You know, it, it's uh, kind of regular in each uh, each group of uh, age and. Of course, it's it's not the same. You must appreciate, uh, for example, the the people they have forty years experience in uh, orchestra, as well as appreciate, for example, uh, the talent of newcomers from the last audition. And it's the question: how to inspire the people in in a in a way that everyone would feel inspired at the same time because you must use different tools and differently speak to these elderly ones as to these younger. And it is, it is also a kind of, of challenge if you want to be and to treat the orchestra as a whole. Thanks very much, Margaret. Um... I'm wondering if we uh, come back to you actually after the, the next uh, presentation and maybe we can have a little bit more conversation about this because um, quiet management, I suppose, also can be a sort of silent organisational culture, which is maybe, yes. Uh, yes. I, I don't know, was maybe sort of partly behind Paulina's question. But thank you very much for your presentation, Margarita. And um, if we can maybe now move on, but we'll return to maybe a conversation between our, our two uh, panellists. If we move on to Antonio, who I believe I believe is with us now. Is that right, Antonio? Great. Um, oh. So we just, yes, perfect. So uh, I realized I didn't introduce myself at the beginning of this. So my name is Neil Smith. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the MCICM. So it's great to have you joining us today. And if I can now introduce Dr. Antonio C. Kyler, um, he's the author of Access, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion in Cultural Organisations, Insights from the Careers of Executive Opera Managers of Colour in the US, uh, and editor of a forthcoming volume, Arts, Management, Cultural Policy and the African Diaspora. Uh, he is director of the MA programme and associate professor of arts administration at Florida State University. Uh, and I'll now just hand it over to you, Antonio. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon as well. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to first start by acknowledging that I am a proud descendant of uh, enslaved Africans from Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Liberia, Senegal, and Sierra Leone. I'd also um, like to acknowledge that I'm joining you this morning from Tallahassee, Florida, um, where the Appalachian Nation, the Muscogee Creek Nation, and the Miccosukee and Seminole tribes of Florida uh, stewarded the land on which I now reside. So I wanna first start with an overview of my, um, my paper. Um, I'll talk about the timeline um, of the phenomenon under study, uh, the research questions that arose as a result of observing the phenomenon, key terms, the methodology, findings, and then of course the conclusions. Okay, so the timeline here. Um, as we know, on 
May 25th of 2020, George Floyd was murdered. Um, and it was a, a, a seismic shift around the world that caused a racial reckoning that we're still in many ways making sense of. Uh, as a result, Opera America, which is the service arts organization in the US that um, supports the advancement and performance of opera, um, for the first time in its history, made a statement that uh, Black Lives Matter. And so that came two days after George Floyd's murder. Then on Instagram appeared this um, anonymous um, profile called Opera is Racist. And that happened in June of 2020. 20. And if what was taking place was people were beginning to anonymous, anonymously share personal stories about racism or racist incidents that they experienced in opera. And at this point, it has over um, 101 posts and um, about 13,000 followers. At the same time, as a result of um, opera is racist, you know, Opera America Statement, George Floyd's murder, the Black Opera Alliance emerged. And, um, you know, their mission is to um, expose systems of oppression that, you know, uh, really prevent people of African descent from being able to fully participate in opera. And so uh, they took a different strategy because um, in response to George Floyd's murder, across the creative sector here in the States, as well in other parts of the world, different um, cultural organizations responding differently. You know, their case studies on what was happening at the Paris Opera, as well as the, um, the Stotts um, Ballet in Berlin. But the Black Opera Alliance um, sought to create a pledge that um, compelled opera companies to uh, commit to racial equity and racial justice. And so um, because of some challenges they were having getting opera companies to commit to that pledge, the Black administrators of opera um, emerged with a letter, an open letter to the field on October 29th of 2020. In the letter to the field, um, Black administrators of opera, there were five major points to the letter, and they asked the opera industry to commit to first equity and promotion opportunities, salaries and wages, uh, company wide racial equity education and professional development, equitable hiring and recruitment practices company-wide intentional inclusion in the execution of mission and programs, and to adequately uh, commit you know, to funding company diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and working groups. At the end of the letter to the field, however, I noticed that it stated that certain members of the Black administrators of opera elected to remain anonymous for fear of retaliation. Initially, the letter cited 25 Black professionals. However, only 14 signed the letter, which means that 11 did not feel comfortable sharing and signing their names. And so this led me to um, some philosophical questions, but also the major research question of this project. So first, um, where are we now? What has changed? What, will, what still needs to change? What will remain the same in the emerging normal? But also philosophically thinking about white privilege, um, is the curse of unearned white privilege and power maddening fear over losing that power and privilege? Is operatic white supremacy culture so retaliatory that it would cause some black people to only advocate for themselves under the cloak of anonymity? And then the research question, the central research question um, of the project is why and how do black opera administrators censor or silence themselves when advocating for racial justice in response to white opera professionals' fragility, privilege, and rage? So before I continue, I wanna um, define uh, two terms. So first, blacktivism. Um, which is, you know, in the title of the, the paper or the chapter. Um, Blacktivism is the use of advocacy, personal agency, and power by Black people to lay the groundwork for political action to inspire changes that will positively impact their lives. And Audre Lorde supports that definition. 
white supremacy culture, um, Okun defined as internalized attitudes and behaviors that do not serve humans because it targets and violates black, indigenous, and people of color and communities with the intent to destroy them directly but also targets and violates white people with a persistent invitation to collude that would inevitably destroy their humanity. The methodology used in the, the chapter uh, is phenomenology. I used a qualitative in-depth semi-structured interview with the founder of Black Administrators of Opera, Quodisha or Quo Johnson to explore unsilencing Black activism in opera. My personal positionality as um, Neil read my bio is um, I, I started out wanting to be an opera singer. I study very intensely um, singing and, and opera and the history of classical music. I earned my bachelor's degree in voice performance um, and then got to a point in my career um, where I decided that I, I would probably be a better administrator than singer. Um, and so I pursued the, uh, the path of um, opera administration and uh, earned a master's degree in arts administration and a doctorate in arts administration. Um, and, and actually just got really excited about research and, and studying um, the other side of arts and classical music and opera um, and decided just to become a professor. My positionality as someone who understands the operatic art form and classical music, um, who has years and years and years of consuming this art form, plus also having the scholarly position, but also the view and perspective of a consultant, makes me a bit of an outsider, which is to my benefit because I'm not so entrenched in, um, um, in the I would say conventionalities that support the art form and the ways in which it has always existed. So um, I'm interested in contesting and transgressing those conventionalities um, to open up and see points of perspectives that we may not always see um, if we are just a singer or just an administrator or just an, a scholar. Uh, in terms of the analysis of the interview, I did a content analysis um, and identified Blacktivism, power, white supremacy culture, and unsilencing as key findings of the study. A bit about Quo Johnson. Um, uh, uh, so as I said before, she is the founder and initiator of the Black Administrators of Opera. She manages rates K through 12 and college educational programs while overseeing the Dallas Opera's commitment to fostering an inclusive culture. She serves local, national, and international communities as a speaker and consultant to help achieve true equity, healing, and connection in the arts. Her additional roles includes projects with Opera America's Racial Justice Opera Network Steering Committee and the Bishop's Arts uh, Theater Center. She earned a bachelor's from Prairie View A&M and a master's in arts administration from Goucher College. So the first finding um, in my chapter is around Blacktivism. And, and so um, I have some quotes from um, Quo where we were co-constructing through this conversation about why the letter was necessary um, and, and power and white supremacy culture and opera and those things. And so um, in terms of co-constructing Blacktivism through our discourse, she said this, building on the work that the Black Opera Alliance did because we share some of the same members and similar goals, we wanted to present what accountability and change looks like from an administrative focused space because we know the reasons behind the budget, hiring and casting decisions. We're the ones doing the work to administrate it, uh, administer this art form to others. Another piece of the puzzle about Blacktivism is that I observe when the phenomenon, this phenomenon is still kind of playing out, right? And so I'm, I'm committed to documenting, documenting and preserving and um, interrogating and investigating as many aspects of the phenomenon as it continues to uh, unfold as is possible. Um, but Blacktivism inspired similar types of activism by Latinx artists as well as Asian artists. And so these two groups, the Latinx Artist Society and Opera and Asian Opera Alliance um, emerged as a result of Blacktivism. And then um, lastly, because I ask Quo about if it was more, if it was possible and um, going to be more advantageous for 
the Black Administrators of Opera, the Black Opera Alliance, the Latin Arts, uh, Latinx Arts Society and Opera and Asian Opera Alliance to work together to, to uh, create racial justice in the field. And her response was, most social and racial progress within the US has come at the expense of Black lives and bodies. The world watched a Black man die as if it were on Animal Planet and then started to move. Uniting is beautiful and must be done as long as we address the rampant anti-Blackness inherent to the system. That, that includes Black spaces. So as long as we commit to disrupting and erasing that hierarchy as we unite, as long as we acknowledge that we benefit from an economy that is on stolen land, built by stolen people with stolen labor, we can go from there. The next finding is power. Um, in our discussion, I theorize that power is neutral. Uh, it is uh, democratic. It is, has no investment in good or bad, no investment in right or wrong. It just is. And at any point, any of us can access power, whether we are oppressed or not. Uh, and, and in response to that, that, that statement, uh, Quo said this, power is definitely neutral. It moves as we actively create opportunities to not just will power, but to direct, shape, and share it in ways that achieve what we want to do. It's when power is consistently hoarded by groups of people, by individuals, that it becomes a weapon for dehumanization and destruction. If we look at the ways that even the Opera America Conference attempted to respond to the racial wave of awakening uh, of last year, many leaders were trying to learn what to do, not to bring about change, but to maintain power. That comfort came at the expense of Black people to all of these white leaders who were freaking out and going to their Black staff for assistance and absolution. I believe there, there's this fear of us gathering because people suddenly realize how much they depend on their Black staff. If you remove those middle individuals seeking power and creating barriers, those feelings of those who do not truly know the meaning of equity and justice that say, I need to watch you, or I need to understand what you're doing, or you need to come to me for approval, take away the power of feeling of authority on this subject. And suddenly people stay, uh, started to see the ways in which their roles don't matter, or that they're not as effective in their roles as they thought they were. So another finding about white supremacy culture. Um, and so, you know, we, in our discussion, we were talking about barriers to why opera has moved so slowly or, or, or um, hasn't moved as more uh, intentionally. And so she said the uh, one barrier is the false belief that to focus on black people harms other identities. When we know that in this nation, equity has moved at the sacrifice of black individuals and bodies. That idea that to focus on one means that we are uh, dismissing others or the idea that you cannot focus on more than one thing at the same time, that either or thinking of white supremacy culture gets in the way. She also quoted, or she also said that much of opera in this nation moves on funding and the whims of donors. Add that we are in a white supremacist society with the human humanizing structures, and there is no way the opera field can develop solutions without looking at the root. In addition, she said, it's the ways that we look at skill and those kinds of covert white supremacy culture norms of meritocracy, bootstrap theory, um, of, of you just have to work harder. Those concepts are barriers. In addition, when I ask her, um, why the letter was um, so necessary. She said, because we knew that there would be pushback from the Black Opera Alliance pledge, but we also knew that the industry needed to hear from its administrators because there is a habit of dismissing the artists who do not often see the moving pieces. The administrative voice was necessary because we're in the space doing the work. We knew that there would be an excuse of, we don't know what to do, tell us what to do, give us instructions so we can check the racial equity box. Simply saying, move out of the way so I can do it is not always beneficial because of white supremacy cultural characteristics of the right to comfort of being the only one, of individualism, of power hoarding. So we wanted to provide a supple, uh, supplemental document from the, the administrative perspective that said, do this, start here, do these things so that it can align with what Black Opera Alliance presented with little uh, space for excuses. And then as it relates to unsilencing, um, when I, I, I asked her why she felt comfortable um, 
signing her name to this open letter. And she said, I personally cannot operate from a space of self-preservation, not when I know what it means to truly connect with others in meaningful ways. I also had the support of my family and the general director, Ian Derer at the Dallas Opera because of the work that we've been doing on company culture. We did not put our organization's names on there because we could not speak for our organizations and knew there would be a greater wave of resistance from those seeking to find a reason to not engage this in this work. Um, we went back and forth about the conversation as a community. Should we sign the letters? Should we list our organizations? We can't speak for organizations. We can speak as ourselves. And then finally, um, you know, um, I was interested in why some people, uh, that was really the question of like why people felt like they um, needed to um, use anonymity um, and, and so uh, this is what she had to say about that. I will not speak directly for the members, but as the founder and the space moderator for Black Administrators of Opera, we wanted to first lead with those individuals who did not feel comfortable enough to sign the letter. People did not feel comfortable signing the letter because they were and still are working in extremely hostile environments that tokenize, dehumanize, use, dismiss, and abuse Black employees. They were not in safe spaces to put their names on the letter because they knew that there would be repercussions that would require a lot of sacrifices that would have been inequitable and unfair. It was not safe for them to do so because of that anger and violent whiteness that would have come from um, back towards them. We wanted to ensure that they were, uh, we were not creating progress at the expense of their lives, livelihoods, and careers in the field. Um, the issue lies with the system. The issue is with the angry leader who is going to be upset that you signed this letter of truth. We have some members who signed and faced repercussions uh, microaggressions, violence, assumptions, and accusations because of the shedding um, of false narratives and bringing such conditions to the uh, to the light. So, in conclusion, um, you know, content analysis of the interview revealed four findings: black divism, power, white supremacy, culture, and unsilencing. Um, a theoretical um, implication of looking at this phenomenon. Um, based on my analysis of the data, Blacktivism simultaneously pushes opera towards anti-racism and creative justice, while threatening white supremacy culture's power in opera, even as it seeks to silence Blacktivism, right? So there's this interesting duality that's happening where, um, you know, Black people are uh, using activism to create racial justice and to push for racial justice, even if they're doing so anonymously. Um, and at the same time, you know, experiencing retaliation, but at the same time doing very important and critical work for the industry um, through this like emotional and uncompensated labor. In terms of research, future research should explore the impact of internalized racism and white supremacy culture on Black, Indigenous, and people of color, as well as organizational structures uh, of Black organizations. So from a practical uh, standpoint, an implication is that the Black administrators of opera does not formally function as a B corporation, nonprofit, or partnership. Um, Black cultural organizations in the U.S. have models from which they can choose from when formally structuring themselves, including Including, like in the African tribe, the Black church, historically Black colleges and universities, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Urban League, the Black Panther Party, Black Lives Matter, or the Black Futures Lab. But the cultural specificity of the principle of these organizations enshrine may find themselves at odds with the characteristics of the white supremacy culture within the nonprofit uh, industrial complex and business entity. Um, another practical implication of this chapter is um, it raised for me the question of does institutionalizing as a nonprofit make Black Opera Alliance, the Black Administrators of Opera, and other, um, you know, um, I guess collectives that have emerged during this time vulnerable to co opting by white supremacy culture, even when it bends towards the liberal? And with that, I say thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Antonio. Fascinating uh, presentation. And uh, also thanks for joining us, which uh, at an early hour for you, I believe. So it's uh, great to be here. Uh, any immediate questions for Antonio? Maybe.
thought it was interesting that there was, uh, yeah, gave quite a different uh, view on a sort of what an atmosphere of respect means and, and can mean to uh, Margaret Atta's uh, presentation. One of the things that was um, mentioned in the uh, in the opening round table was um, the music itself, which is, and I know that's not really something you're you're touching on here, but um, opera is a kind of, I don't know, perhaps one of the supreme kind of white art forms. I'm wondering what the what the other repercussions um, of uh, of this move of blacktivism um, what they is for the art form more widely rather than sort of the art like if we're uh, yeah um, not sort of parceling the organization and, and the art form in two different things but thinking of those two things together i wonder what the consequences of that might be um, well you know um the space opening um more for questions and uh considerations that we just haven't had the courage to explore before. Um, and what comes out of that, I think, for example, at the Metropolitan Opera uh, last year um, was the premiere of the first opera by a black composer in the Metropolitan Opera's almost 140 year history. Um, and there was a New York Times kind of like expose on around the history of black composers submitting operas for consideration of performance at the Metropolitan Opera and how those operas and those composers were treated. And, and so it, it's, we know, and it's the same thing, you know, like we can uh, subtract black people and insert um, women or trans people or people with disabilities. And we, we know that globally um, there is this, this thing that some humans feel in, entitled and empowered to oppress and marginalize other people. And so um, globally, I feel like we are finally finding the courage to have these conversations about what it means when um, all of us cannot have access to living a creative and expressive life, right? Like it, it is innately human, I think, to desire to live a creative and expressive life. And, and why is it that some of us are more entitled to that than others? And not only that, what creative deficits do we suffer when all of us cannot have a creative and expressive life? What is lost to the whole of humanity when people with disabilities are not allowed to actively participate in classical music as musicians, composers, conductors, singers, um, directors, or what have you. Absolutely. Um, yeah, any questions, just raise your hand or stick it in the chat. Otherwise, I will continue because I've got a few. Um, something, uh, so I've been talking to a number of people who actually recently who have created kind of guidelines for change and that sounded a little, ah, well, okay, I'll shut up for a moment. And uh, yeah, Car uh, Carol Mann, please. Hello, thank you, Antonio. It was very, very, very interesting. Um, some of it's quite close to my PhD research at the moment. Um, I'm based at King's College in London. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on your sort of closing comments about um, aspects of the black organizational culture that could be, I, I can't remember if you used the word co-opted or appropriated. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit more, what you were thinking. Yeah, oh, I'm so glad that you asked that question. Um, so in the US, what happens is that there are um, you know, white people who identify as conservatives, um, you know, we call them conservative cultural warriors or radical, the radical right. Um, those people, I think, are very honest about their positions on racism, sexism, cisgenderism, right? Like, they're very forth, uh, forthright about their positions. On the other side of the table, on the left side, which is supposed to be more open-minded, more liberal, oftentimes some white people are not always aware of their potentiality to fall into racist tropes, um, to do things and behaves in, in ways 
that actually um, actually advance the characteristics of white supremacy culture. And if you aren't familiar with um, Okun's work, um, you can, you know, a very easy task is to go uh, Google white characteristics of white supremacy culture, Okun, and it will bring up, you know, um, work that she started back in 2001 and that she's updated since 2001. And so white people, because of the ways in which we're conditioned in U.S. society, right, can easily also fall into this desire of wanting to control, wanting to own, wanting to have, if they're not uh, careful. And so what we're seeing, what I'm observing, and again, my positionality um, gives me this, this space to be able to sit back and, and watch, kind of almost like the centaurs in Greek mythology, right? They were the watchers and the seers um, and, and, and astrology. Um, and so I get to watch and observe and document. And, and, and what I'm seeing is sometimes the white people who want to help, want to assist, also want to own and to take. Um, and, and sometimes the ways in which they do that is okay, well, we're, we'll offer you money because we live in this capitalist system where um, incentives can be created around whether you give someone money or not, right? But what if the person doesn't care so much about money? Then it might be power, we'll give you some power. We will share a little bit of power in this particular operatic space. We will give you visibility, we will give you access. And so um, I'm wanting to say, like I said to, I don't think Quo had thought about this. I'm like, are you aware that the further down the line that you go, you're gonna have to be diligent about maintaining this, um, this structure that is more of a collective where white liberals cannot pinpoint one leader to go to and perhaps um, subvert or, or take or, undermine the potential the potential of the power that you are accessing and that you're using for good right now and so you know i apologize for the lengthy explanation but um you know i wanted to unpack some of that because it's so u.s specific okay right. that's really that's really interesting thank you i was wondering is this um I mean, I, I see some resonances with that in, in some of my case studies for my PhD here. Um, is this linked to the concept of power as well that you were talking about earlier? So um, I guess in sort of the structure of society based on white dominance, if you like, um, power is hoarded. So even if someone is, yeah, so, it com so power sharing can easily become easily be turned back into sort of um, um, a, a sort of power hoarding. Is Absolutely. It, is that, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, especially if you're not careful. And so one of the first things, and, and that from a personal standpoint, one of the first things I've been working with is um, trying to understand what exactly is my power and when are the, when are the times that I don't use it what are the circumstances? What, are the comp what is the composition of the environment that says to me, don't use your power now, <laughs> right? Versus those times where I decide, you know what? It's gonna cost me, but it's worth it. Okay. Thanks very much for the question okay. and for the response. Um, I don't know, Antonio, I don't know if you uh, have just 10 seconds just to put a link to the chapter in the, the chat, I think that might be really useful. Sure. Uh, and if anyone's got any questions for either panelists, just uh, shout out. I had one maybe that perhaps both could contribute to, and that is regarding um, inspiration. I think that's one, um, well, so inspiration, not supervision. That was one of the things uh, Margot Shanta uh, identified. And um, as I started to say, the, uh, I've been looking at various sort of um, guidelines for change that different organisations have um, been using recently or for a whole wide range of things, such as the fair access principles from Sound and Music about how to work with young composers, for example. But um, uh, they, they are very much about positive action. 
and um, yeah, and I'm wondering how the how yeah the the, the two of you have any thoughts on that because my my own thought is I I agree I imagine psychologically that positive action is the best way to reach people, but also can it be the only thing if we're all if we're in a, a situation which is so unsatisfactory at the moment? Um, maybe start with Margaret. Jackson. Uh, sorry, could you repeat? Because um, I, I was just trying to put my presentation into chat. And oh, no, it. okay, sorry. Um, well, it was about kind of, um, so you mentioned about inspiration yes. being so effective mm -hmm. in, in the orchestral con um, context, but what if the, the sort of situation is very unsatisfactory and we're trying to always appeal to people's uh, sort of positive sides or we're trying to inspire them what um how do we deal with this this conflict or this this issue well um uh, uh i i don't i cannot say that it's uh, um, directly our experience but um i have this feeling that um uh, this talent management is sometimes or this quiet management could be understood uh, not in the right way so uh, maybe it's a question of tools you may use uh, while uh, you want to just uh, develop this strategy of, of uh, really, really uh, human care in your organization. Because if you want, uh, it's, it's not only about uh, uh, giving something, but it's also about um, expecting something. You, you must expect uh, the high quality, for example. You must expect... Uh, some kind of engagement. But uh, as I said, you want to build uh, some kind of very safe uh, conditions uh, of, of cooperation. But it, because if you do not expect anything instead, you have just people they don't want to develop. And it's, it's a wrong meaning of democracy. So you, you give some kind of space, you give freedom, but you don't set the limits, the borders. And it's also, uh, it's also uh, just mistake. Uh, it could be mistaken. I mean, even if it's goodwill, could be mistaken uh, when it's wrong used. When it's uh, used in a wrong way. Yeah, thanks. I think that's, that's, uh, that's a useful point. Thank you very much. And uh, Antonio, any last thoughts? Um, you know, I think the way, because I, you know, the thing that stuck out to me in your question was inspiration, and and um, I think for me it's about being in relationships with each other, right? Like, how are we relating to one another, and um, is is there a, a way that we can be in relationship with each other that is less transactional, um, and that is simply about at the intention of the relationship is just to be in relationship with each other, right? Like the whole goal of it is to like, to learn how to relate to one another as humans, which is gonna be a lot more challenging as we come out of the pandemic, right? Um, because some of us don't wanna go back to the office and some of us are more comfortable in remote spaces. Um, you know, one of the things that I learned about myself is that I really am an ambivert. I, I sit in between the space of extrovert and introvert and there are times when I come home and I'm like, thank God, I'm home by myself. I don't have, you know, a spouse or children. I can just sit and, and be along with my thoughts. And, and there are times when I, I go out with friends and I'm like, oh, it's so great to connect with friends. So um, I think I think all of this, is, uh, is the important thing is about being in relationship, real relationships with one another to understand what it is that we, what we need what inspires us to be inspired by each other um, and to partner with each other for the sake of partnering and less about transaction. A great, uh, great last word. So thank you so much to our two contributors for two really interesting papers. Um, the, the sort of next uh, official session, I believe is in one hour. So at uh, 1500 CET. Um, we do, however, have a sort of informal meet if you want to just come and chat to uh, some of the people from the MCICM or chat to some other people uh, who are at the conference. Uh, 
you know, at the conference, then we have uh, this coffee uh, break at quarter past two, so in uh, 13 minutes. But thanks so much for joining me and uh, for joining us, and thanks to, again to our, present, our presenters. So Great. thanks so much, guys. See you soon. <laughs>